Uh, there we go. So there's there's six of us. So there, I know there's usually more, but a couple of people said they wouldn't be able to tune in for one reason or another. And it's good. I think it's going to be like that from here on in because people are starting to have lives, uh, which uh, is a good thing. Uh, but uh, anyway, so it might reduce the numbers that we see joining us on a weekly basis, but they're still tuning in and getting the recordings, and working on the stuff anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Anyway, get this thing out. So at one of the, um, um, I say o OCFO, but one of the Celtic Fiddle Orchestra rehearsals, I was struggling, struggling, struggling with the scale. And my open strings were honking and any, any string that was fingered was fine. And I was just copying your pitch. Yeah. And then I realized that my tuner was calibrated to 448 instead oh. of 440. <laughs> Yes, very, very common uh, thing to have happen. I felt, I felt, I felt, I was so embarrassed. I was so glad I was by myself. <laughs> but you said that the fingered notes were working okay. Yeah, because I just matching you, like I'm just matching me. Yeah. Well, that's a good sign. That's and you know, it's helping at least you're you're doing good with your ears and you're making the change no matter what, and that's good. But uh, you know, I'll tell you. I mean, on the tunable, it's not so bad because you got to go into the settings to change that on the tunable, right? Okay. Uh, but uh, on the, my yeah, old uh, Korg, this, this is that, mine, oh, yeah. that's the one, yeah. that's the bugger there. <laughs> and, and the thing about it is, is that the calibration buttons are right next to the power button. <laughs> so you press that power button and I, I don't know anybody that hasn't accidentally uh, pressed that calibration button. It's always up and yours was up, right? It's always up. It's never down because that's not where the button is, right? And so many people have had that problem with that tuner. I wish they hadn't put those buttons right next to the power button. <laughs> but on the other hand, that is probably, I would say, the best tuner on the market for a store-bought tuner. It's the cheapest one. But uh, me and Jennifer went through all the ones at the music store back in uh, 2001. And when she started, uh, when she started doing her, no, 2003, when she started doing her second postgraduate degree. And uh, the, we went through all the ones that, at the music store that I worked at, all, and some really expensive $200 tuners. And that Korg CA-15, $15, $15 tuner was the only one that would hear the complete bottom range of the tuba. Wow. And so I always thought that was kind of, and also I found it to be the best and so did Jen for, for practicing with, because people didn't practice with tuners at the time. It was, it's a fairly new thing because the tuners used to be old, uh, slow, the old ones. So if you were using it to practice, it wasn't very good because it would respond after you all the time. It's like, it wasn't very good for keeping track of how you're doing, but, but that one, the CA-15, but many people practice with that one because it's instantaneous. It's very, very quick to follow you. Same as the tunable. That's what I love about the tunable as well. So anyway, yeah. So that's that's a very common problem there, Elizabeth. Sorry about that. 448, that's that's pretty up there. Like the Sapporo Symphony, they tuned to 4, 4, 40, uh, 446. And that's pretty sharp, you know what I mean? But not even Sapporo Japan would do 448. <laughs> it's interesting that in Europe they do 439. And I guess apparently Montreal Symphony also does 439. It's a slightly mellower sound on of the uh, of the A. Anyway, so since I'm on vacation, we're, we're going to do a kind of a little bit shorter uh, class tonight, an hour and a half instead of uh, an hour and 45 minutes because uh, the pizza didn't come. Uh, so anyway, so why don't we get warmed up? We'll do our scale and arpeggio and, and, and make sure the hand is in a good spot and everybody's feeling good. And then we'll move on and work on our music. Okay. I'm going to get my phone to have the tuner on. Okay.
All righty. So let's start off with a little G major, shall we, for a change. Ready, go. Ready, go. How's everybody feeling about G that time around? Not too bad? It's great. Okay, let's go faster. All right, up in the game. We're gonna go faster. So let's do it about this fast now. <clears throat> and we're gonna do it twice. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do it that fast, scale and then arpeggio. And I want everybody to pay attention. What notes went wrong, okay? After we're done, we're gonna do it again. And that's your chance to do it with those notes also going right. All right. Now, if you go through and you find it's kind of every note went wrong, you know, I understand. It's just kind of a bad go. You know what I mean? But if you find that there's just a few, then the second time we do it, we get them that time around. So two times, scale and then arpeggio, consider what went wrong, do it again, a chance to fix those things. Let's try it and see what happens. And I'd be anxious to hear your feedback when we're done. So, a one, two, three, go. Okay, now I'll tell you my feedback right away. I had C on the A string. My very, very first touch on it was a tiny bit flat. And then when I went down the scale uh, on the G string, the B was a tiny, tiny sliver. I had to press a little harder right away to bring it in. Now, anybody got any feedback for me? How did it go? Was it a, a complete disaster? Yes, Pearl. Um, I, it was not a complete disaster. Oh, good. Um, I, uh, I always misjudge my F. Uh, I always think it's just a little bit sharper than it is. And so I constantly hear it. I'm like, nope. And I have to bring it down a little bit. Um, but uh -huh. I got it on the way down. It was mess on the way up, but I got it on the way down, which is pretty good. Okay. Now here's the way I have the same problem with the high D in the third position. Say so exactly the same problem. I think I'm in tune. I look at the tuner and it's sharp. Okay, so here's the way to battle it, and I've been having very good luck with this myself, which is open and then one. You're, you're talking about the one on the E string, right? Yeah, and that's a hard one. Open and then one. Don't tune it. Look at the tuner. And then say you do that, you see that it's a little sharp, a little bit on the sharp side. Do another one. Open and then one with a little less pressure. Look at the tuner. Oh, now I'm right. 
Then you try to get two or three exactly the same. Most of the time, it's all about finger pressure. And when you go to grab it the first try in tune, you want to get the same pressure as you usually use. That's the thing, right? <clears throat> chances are you're not that sharp. So chances are if you just ch be a little bit gentler, you're probably going to get it every time. See what I mean? You might not have to actually move your finger. That's kind of the last resort. Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. And it doesn't take much. So usually with most people, it's like this. They try it. It's at a tune. Then they make the change, it's in tune. Then they're able to get it in tune on the first try, usually three or four more times before it goes awry. And when it go goes awry, go to another, do it with a different note, you know, because you can beat a dead horse with this. But the, I call them drop downs, and they're really effective for grabbing notes that your ear misunderstands at first. And the good thing about it is that your ear will come along and figure out, get the story, and know that. The F sharp is what it is, you know, for my for my experience with my high D, I'm still at the point where when I hit it, it sounds a little bit flat to me, but I'm using that signal as the sign that it's in tune. So when it sounds a tiny bit flat to my ear, I know I'm in tune. Now, eventually it'll sound in tune to my ear, right? But right now I got to use that sign. I got to use that signal. All right. Who else? Give me some feedback about your scale. Yes, Susan. Mine is the um, A on the G string. Which it's way? The same, it's the same as um, Pearl was saying on the E string. Mine is the first finger on the G string. And is it always sharp? Yeah, uh, no, it's flat actually. I don't go high enough. Okay. Now see if you can get there with the finger pressure. The G string is extremely loose and very, very susceptible to finger pressure. It's the, it's the string that responds to finger pressure the most. So chances are, if you press hard enough, you'll probably get up high enough. Now, the thing is, and this is specific about the low A. One thing about the low A to remember is that it's the first step up from the bottom of your fiddle, all right? The bottom of your fiddle is a G. It's the lowest note it can play. Now, there is an A flat. But we never play A flat in our music. That's just very, very seldom do we play A flat. So really, the first step up from the bottom of the fiddle for us is that A, okay? Very important note to get what I call comfortable. And when I'm talking about being comfortable on that note, I'm talking about bringing your finger down and, and having it so that you're not kind of leaning really far forward to get it in tune or leaning really far backward to get it in tune or pressing like hell or not hardly pressing at all you want somewhere in the middle see that and that's why i think that it's really the reference for your hand so if you find a, a place where your finger can come down and be mostly in tune maybe with a little bit of pressure that's the comfy spot that's the best spot for you see what i mean yeah, yeah. okay and it's very important to work on that note that is like for a lot of people that has made the big difference with everything they play all right, that centering, that low A. So yeah, so just make sure it's a comfy spot before you start. All it takes is a couple of these. Feels good, feels comfortable, the tuner's happy, off you go. Okay, who else? Anybody else have feedback for me about a note that bothers them, a, a note that they hate, a note that, the, that, that sticks in their craw? I usually have trouble with that G string and the A, B, and C notes. They're not always in tune, but I like what you've just suggested. So maybe drop maybe downs are drop yeah, downs are excellent. Down. On, and the, now here's if you want to do drop downs on more than the fingers that I've mentioned here tonight, I always suggest starting with third finger drop downs. So that's where you go. See that. And the reason that I do that is because, first of all, if you don't, you don't even need a tuner to do third finger drop downs because you can use the string below to tune. See that? It's a great way to do it. So, and also, if you strengthen your third finger for most people, all the other ones just kind of line up behind it pretty nice and easy. But 
If you have trouble with those other ones, you do the same thing with them. Now, Karen's talking about the G string. And I'm going to tell you, I talked about how important that low A is and how easy it is to screw up. The B is a constant problem for everybody. Even when it's to in tune, it doesn't really sound strong. So it requires extra listening and extra attention, that B on the G string. The C is even worse because it's a third finger note on the fiddle that does not ring because it's a C. It's not a G or a D or an A. Now, in my nice German fiddle, $20,000, I get a little bit of a ring off of that C, right? But on most normal fiddles, you would not get any, okay? So it takes extra listening because you don't get that automatic signal of the ring when you're in tune. See what I mean? Well, unlike the other third finger notes, which are G, D, and A, it gives you a clear signal when you're in tune. The other thing about the C is that even when it's in tune, it sounds like a fart. And so you just really have to listen close when it's in tune and just try to get to know that low C. It's different from the middle C. At least the middle C has a little bit of meat behind it. But that low C, very hard to hear for most people. So it takes a lot of extra listening. The B and the C, a lot of extra listening. Why, why doesn't that C ring? The, two, the fiddle is built to put out D, G, and A. And that's, I don't know if you've noticed, but most of our, our music and our tradition, which is kind of very fiddle-based, is in D, G, and A, and they're relative minors, which is C, E minor, B minor. And, then, and that's pretty well all of Irish and Scottish music there, right? <clears throat> and so it's because when the fiddle makers got the fiddle here, this was supposed to be a jam night, not a teaching night. But anyway, I still love talking about it so much. I could talk about the fiddle for hours. But anyway, so the fiddle, when the fiddle maker's putting together the fiddle, he's making the top and the bottom or the or the back, and this is the top, separately. And because they're made of two different kinds of wood. The top is made of spruce and the bottom is made of maple. Okay. And when he's got those plates in his hand and he's carving them, he gets them to the point where he thinks that they're done and then he taps it with a with a piece of metal like the, it's the back of their chisel and they tap it in front of the tuner to see what note it makes when they when you tap it and so for the for the belly they call what they call the top or the belly of the fiddle the top the upper bouts these round parts of the fiddle here are called bout bouts b-o-u-t t and these are the upper bouts and these are the lower bouts okay so this area at the top, the upper bouts of the, of the belly are tuned to, the, uh, to the, the D. The lower bouts of the fiddle here are tuned to a G. And the back of the fiddle is the big A. The whole thing makes an A. And that's why if you ever go to an orchestra concert, your concert you'll notice that they tune the A string first. And that's why, because that's the basis of the instrument. It's, and that's why most violin music is in sharp keys. Like, unlike my wife who plays the tuba, all of her music is in flat keys because her instrument is geared to put out those flat harmonics. See what, but the fiddle is D, G, and A. Okay. So when you hit a D or a G or an A on the fiddle, especially the high ones, it makes that piece of wood resonate the way it should, like a bell ringing. And it'll continue to ring after you play it. So I'll just give you a little example here. So here's a D. So I'm going to play it and I want you guys to listen to the ring. Still going. See that? Now it's finally gone. Here's the A. It's a pretty big one too, man. Very, very nice. And then the G. Still going. That lasts almost as long or longer than the D. Here's the high G. Oh, I love that one. It's just so rich and gorgeous. But again, you gotta hit them in tune. If you don't, here's the high G at a tune. No ring. Falls right off flat. See that? Here it is in tune again. There you go, you get your ring. Same with the A. Same with the low A. That's a big, deep, rich one. You hear that? And again, if it's not in tune, half is half the ring length. Okay, so that's true of any DG high mode. That's oh, and Diana, hi guys. 
Uh, so that's true of any D, G, or A on your fiddle. And that's why, like, back in the Royal Conservatory days when people didn't have tuners to, to practice along with, my teacher would be constantly getting me to listen for those rings and getting me to compare against open strings. So that's why I say the third finger ones are so good to do because... Let's do a little quick check in there, eh? Because it's an octave, it's easy to tune. So that's why, yes. Um, so is it only the third finger on the DG, uh, B, A, and E string or, or G? Any yeah. G, D, or A on your fiddle. Yeah. Any one. So the low A with the first finger on the G string is a ringer. Yeah. The, the third finger on the D string is a ringer. Yeah. On the A string, it's the third finger. On the E string, we got the high G and the high A, both ringers. Okay. But the other fingers, one and two, like they don't ring. Well, it uh, on the G down on the G string, it does because that's an A. It's 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 more the the oh, note, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mouth, not the finger. Oh, G, D, and A. Okay, I get it. G's, G's and A's because yeah. that's what the fiddle is is built uh, to. Be. Now it's interesting because before they had tuners, the the luthier used to do it with iron filings. Can you imagine this? I can't imagine those days like eighteen ten. You know, and so he would carve it. And then he would put the iron filings, sprinkle the iron filings onto the top of the instrument and tap it. And if they settled in a certain pattern, he would know that that's the right note. See that? Very complicated. Like that's, you know, it's amazing really. But so remember those notes. Those are ringer notes. Those are reference notes. You don't need a tuner. You just listen for that ring and you know you're at least getting those notes in tune. And like I say, the, those are mostly third finger notes, except for the G string, unfortunately. So if you get those third finger notes in tune, then the two and the one probably going to be pretty lined up behind it. So when you said the top of the, the bouts, and yep. I thought about, but never mind, the, the top bouts and the bottom bouts, which, yep. which is tuned? The top? E? Did you say E? Dog. Dog. D. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And girl. Girl. Okay. And the big A. Got it. Okay. D, G, and A. Got it. Got it. I, and A, I is the, and A is the main one. A is the big fundamental yeah. tone of the violin. Like that's, and like I say, that's why, that's why they tune the A string first in the orchestra. Yeah, right? yeah. And that's why the A440 that, that everybody yeah. knows. I never knew all this and I think that's I think it's fascinating. I love it. And it actually yeah. it tell you the truth, it helps me get a better sound out of the fiddle. And it'll help you guys too. When you understand how it works, has anybody ever explained how the, the machine works? Like I'm sure I have, but mm -hmm. I'll just remind you. So under the I've told you about the, the two different kinds of wood. So the top is spruce, soft wood, vibrates slowly. And so underneath the bridge under the D and the G strings, which are the bass strings, is something called a bass bar. And it's a piece of wood glued up at a right angle underneath the top of the instrument like this. It's about that long. And it spreads the, the vibration from the low strings across the soft wood to put out the low frequencies because the soft wood vibrates slow. Underneath the high side or the treble side of the fiddle, the A and the E strings right under the bridge, is the sound post and everybody knows about the sound post it, it looks like a little pillar in there and that brings the vibrations from the high strings down to the hardwood which vibrates fast and puts out the high frequencies so this is your woofer and this is your tweeter see that and that's how a fiddle works that's exactly in the the design has not changed in all these hundreds of years it's still the same design of producing sound all right yes pearl Kind of related, kind of unrelated. Uh, <laughs> I'm just wondering, what would be a good reference note for like ear training? Because I'm trying to get more of that, especially as I play. Like I've always played fiddle. I started with fiddle music, and I did learn by ear for a long time. But then as I got into school, especially middle school, they they were like, "Oh, you need to know how to read music." So eventually, yes. I kind of stopped training my ear, and I'm trying to do that more. And is there, is like what 
are there good reference notes? So while you're listening to somebody uh, and hearing the space between the notes, is there a reference note, maybe like a note that rings extra, like the threes? Like, are you talking about fiddle in particular? Fiddle, listening to a fiddle? Yeah. Or a violin? Yeah. Okay. On the violin, you only have a few reference notes to hold on to. That's such a good question, Pearl. Very good question. But this is the plague of violinists, right? There's no frets. There's no keys. There's no holes. There's nothing. There's just the note could be anywhere on the string, right? So, but assuming your fiddle's in tune, your four strings are your reference notes. All right. Now you can't assume your fiddle's in tune. First of all, you always have to check and that's why if you ever go to a violin concert, the soloist will, will tune his instrument between every movement, all constantly checking. You can never trust. You always have to check. So first of all, you got to make sure it's in tune. Second of all, you got to make sure your bow is not putting you out of tune, right? Because if you push too hard on that open string, the pitch will drop a half a semitone. Have any of you guys ever noticed that? No? Oh, my God. Yeah. Here, watch. I'll show you. Experiment. Yeah especially on the low strings so when i slow down my bow and push on it too hard everybody watch your tunable you hear that here it is on the a string Are you seeing that drop in the pitch there? And that wasn't even pushing really that hard. Like, and most people notice this problem when they start to do double stops because it's so easy to push too hard on one string or another, right? Especially the E. The E is a bugger. Look at that. Well, it's, mine's working pretty good tonight, but you get the idea, okay? So you have to be careful of that because if your bow is putting you out of tune, that really, really, you know, give, uh, gives you a setback with trade in your ear. So that's the only references that we can count on, and we can't even really count on them, okay? The other ones, though, you want to listen for are the D, G, and A. Now, for the most part, if you're in a mo major key, if you're playing something that's in the key of D major and you're playing in tune, the whole thing's going to be ringing here and there and back and forth with all those D's and A's. And it's going to be like ring, ding, 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 ding. And, then, and it's a bright sound. And that's what I always try to point out to people. When somebody's playing in tune, it's a bright and cheerful sound. When somebody's playing flat, it's a depressing sound. It makes you go like this, you know, it's weak. It takes a lot of volume out of the sound right away, and it's kind of like underpowered, depressed feeling. When pe yes, that's why my friends run for the hills when I start playing. <laughs> no, but they could also be sharp because although flat is depressing, it doesn't assault the ear. It just makes you kind of like oh. But with the sharp, it hits your ear and it hurts your ear. Okay, now let me give you a little example. Okay, so first of all, I'm going to play something in tune. Now you hear some ringing in there with some of those D's and, and uh, the G's on the D string there. Now I'm going to play that flat. Okay, you getting the sound of that? Do you see what I mean by a little bit depressed and underpowered? Now, here it is sharp. Now, I can see everybody's face kind of go like, Ugh. and it's interesting because like people sometimes have patience for the flat players, like they'll sit through it. You know, you might feel sorry for the guy, but you'll sit through it. But the sharpness makes them run for the hills, you know, and it's good to pay attention to that, too. That's another reference <laughs> is the exit of the audience. 
Yeah, my bow for tuning actually hasn't been much of an issue because both of them broke recently. <laughs> oh. So I had to practice for like three days plucking everything. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It, they're just, one of them's completely messed up. The other one's, eh. And so we had to get a new bow. Okay. Well, there you go. Happy new bow. That's pretty nice. Yeah, uh, I had to add a lot of rosin to it. <laughs> Oh yeah, of course. Brand new bow, you always gotta load it up. And you gotta be patient too. Some people get to jump the gun and they do this thing with their frog. I, I think it was a YouTube video. I don't know, but I have four or five people that said they take their rosin and they beat it up with the frog of their bow and then they put it on the bow and I'm like, don't, don't do that for God's sakes, you know? But it's you should avoid that. Like just to have, put in the time, break through that top layer and you'll get a good bit of rosin on there, but you do need to load load it up at first because it's bare. They do they do a bit at the luthier, but you got to do it. Okay, that was my intonation talk. This was supposed to be jam night, but it was very good questions, and I hope that helps people. I think it will. Uh, I'd like to have more feedback next time about the drop downs if you decide to do some, which I really really. If you look on my YouTube channel, there are drop downs on there. Okay. So you can use me to tune if you want. That's I, I prefer the tuner. I prefer making it and 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 have it glanceable. Like try not to have it right in front of you because then it becomes a video game. You want to have it kind of adjacent. You make the decision and then you look and see if you're right. You see what I mean? And then you try to correct that with a certain move or whatever and get the result every time. That's going to really hasten the process of your training. All right. Anyway, okay, so let's try our scale of Hedgeo once more, and then we'll try, uh, we'll play Drunken Landlady. Okay, a little bit speedy. A one, two, three, go. some E minor now. I forgot to mention with the drop downs and what Pearl was saying that when you play the open string first and then put your finger down, your ear does the little bit of math there, right? So if it's your third finger, it's a fourth. So it's A, one, two, three, four. Or sorry, A, one, A, two, three, four. And you get a chance to do that before you make a stab at the note. So that really helps. Always play that open string first. Anyway, drunken landlady. And uh, can anybody give me an idea of the t of the speed we left off at? Because I know this is one we're trying to get faster. Does anybody remember the number? No. Oh no. Let's try seventy. I think we. I seem to recall we were up to seventy-five, and you wanted to go faster. Seventy-five seemed pretty fast, but. You know, let's try 70 foot. Well, you know what? Let's try 72. Okay. Give us, give people a chance of getting everything, but it is a little bit of a push. So let's try 72 and then we'll see how everybody's doing. If we can make it faster, it'd be really great. And uh, I got to turn the sound off of this. There we go. Oh, no, that's 120. That's not 72. Okay. That's how fast we're gonna go. All right, should we try it? I'll count you in. One, two, three, go! Wrong tune. Sorry about that. That was that was uh, drowsy Maggie or Coolies. Sorry, I think it was Coolies. 
no, it was Drowsy Maggie, which is also a great tune. Have we done Drowsy Maggie? No? Oh, we'll have to do that one. It's a quick one. It's a single. It's not that Drowsy hard. Maggie is my absolute favorite one. Oh, it's wicked and it's got a roll in it. It, uh, it rocks. <laughs> it's got an up bow roll in it. It's awesome. So we'll, we'll do that sometime. Anyway, Drunken Landlady, which is going to be this. Okay. Here we go. One, two, three. Go! Time. 
time. And I should have told everybody what was in the whole set before we started this. You know, I need reminders for sure. Now, how did we do at 72? How did you do, Sue Leader? Give me your feedback. So, yeah, I I really practiced uh, the first two this week, the man behind the bar and uh, the drunken landlady. Mm -hmm. uh, to get up to speed, I left the wise maid because, uh, you know, you can only do so much in a week. Yep. Um, and so I was able to keep up with the first two. The, the, the wise maid, I had to sort of jump in and out, but I, 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 could, keep, I could keep up with the other two easily. Okay. And that, easily. Good. Good. Okay. And that was 72. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. Well, that's, and, and you know, like I was enjoying that tempo. Like it's, it's almost at the point where you can put a groove on it. Not quite, but, but if we can get it smooth there, then we have a hope of, of getting a groove in it. So that's very good yeah. to hear. Yeah. How about anybody else? Anybody else? Give me your experience at 72. Yes, Pearl. Um, for me, it wasn't getting the notes or even like the rhythm or anything. It was my shoulders started to like really hurt. So yeah. I had to a few times, 
because I just couldn't keep it there. Um, this is your left shoulder, eh? Yeah. Okay. My advice to you, Pearl, I've been through this and I've paid my dues and I've had numb fingers and, and gone to see acupuncturists and physiotherapists and all that kind of stuff with the left shoulder. And what I have discovered is any discomfort with the left shoulder is because it's doing this while you play. Okay. Okay. So for me, I had to use, start using a shoulder rest, but also I frigged with it for like a year before it, it was comfortable. It took a lot and two different ones, so actually three, three different shoulder rests before I finally figured out a solution that was going to let me put the fiddle there without this. See that? And when I get tired, this is the first thing that starts to happen. So I always talk about the hour three of the dance that I'm playing. That's when I notice this start to come up and I got to start trying to breathe, trying to keep it relaxed. All the time I'm thinking about that shoulder relaxing it and trying to see whether I'm doing this, like all the time. Okay, does that make sense to you? Does that even talking about it, does it make you feel better? It still hurts, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> it's all about for me anyway I mean it could be different for you like it's really could be different for everybody but for me it was the relaxation factor okay so see if you can do that mindfully relax that shoulder as we play but that was a long set at 72 that took us about five minutes straight to get through so that is a bit of a long set for sure anybody else give me some feedback about 72 Anyone? Um, I found it on, sorry. I found it a bit on the fast side, um, but what I really get tripped up in, in the wise mate is the scales and thirds and these little triad bits, like the dun 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 Your arpeggio. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I just, yeah. So I have to practice that one for sure. Now, uh, my best advice for that one there is the uh, the right hand doing the string crossing for you rather than this. <laughs> okay. Okay, that's okay. my best advice for those particular arpeggios because they go from the D to the A, A, eh? the D string to the A string, and uh, and you don't need any movement at all to go between D and A. You do it entirely with your hand there. So if you're doing any amount of arm movement at all, you, it's really hard to get through that. See what I mean? So that might help you. And practicing the arpeggios themselves are going to help too. All right. Um, Simone, you had something you were going to say. Um, yeah, just because I haven't been here in a while. So I was like, whoa, this is so fast. But I was trying to think, yeah, again, about the like, but just like trying to use my hand more. Yeah. Get going, which have to practice, but was trying to be cognizant of it. Yeah. And do you, did you find it was helping when you were thinking about it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Yeah, it occurs to me that uh, next time when we do our double stops, because next time will be a serious butt kicker. It's not going to be a fun session. It's going to be a serious skill kicker. Uh, and we'll, when we do our double stops, we'll do some hand, 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 arm, arm on double stops. The best thing all time to strengthen hand bowing is this, but on double stops. Okay, and I know you know how to do those already. So that might help you even more. Jocelyn, you were going to say something? Yes, yeah, still not there. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. Um, Speed for so, all three or just one in particular? Um, well, the wise maid is definitely the wise. hardest one, but uh, um, the other ones still, it's, it's, I still haven't got that uh that bounce in there that's my biggest struggle and every time i i don't know i um no i guess no excuses it's just um when i learned to play classical it was always start so slow and and practice the quality you know uh of the sound which should be there and um i think also that trips me up if it's not a hundred percent i don't like to play it if it doesn't yeah, of course um, the bow arm is your biggest critic man it will not move yeah, if it doesn't yeah if it doesn't like what's about to come out but you know what you brought up such a good point with the sound quality 
because when we're playing eighth notes, you don't get much of a chance to produce a nice sound, right? You're right. going to be using that much bow, and if you don't have the nice sound right away, it's kind of like the note is gone, right? So, and so people, I have a few people over the years, classical violinists, that have been trying to switch gears, right? Trying to make the change. Yeah. Very yeah, difficult. Yeah, yeah. Very, very difficult. And this has worked really well with them. Take the bow and drop it on the string. Now I got a rosin my bow. Hold on. Because we have to make momentary nice notes with just momentary little touches, right? Because you only right. have a limited amount of bow to do it in. And also, a lot of the time when you really get going, it is like kind of like hitting a drum with a drumstick, you know, when you're kind of go really doing it, and it really does mimic that. So I get I get these violinists to drop that bow down over and over until it starts to make a decent sound just with the little bit of bow. There we go. You hear that? Nice little momentary notes without a lot of crunch and without a lot of slick kind of scrapey, anything like that. It never starts off that way, even for me. I got to do three or four before they start sounding good. That one's, that one's working real good. And you see, I'm just, I'm hammering it. Uh, uh, giving her, giving her a little push. Of course, the E is the most, the most fussy. No weight, just length. See that? And so what that does is you, you, your fingers learn the touch you need to make a decent sound right away with that much bow. And then when the notes start flying, you have a much better chance of a lot of those working. Everybody always kind of crunches on the down bow, eh? The down bow is when you crunch. So practicing that move can really improve that. And the thing is about getting the good sound you're talking about, fiddle players love that too. I mean, everybody has a different sound. You want to make your sound as beautiful as possible. We're all trying to, you know, except it's harder for us because we only use that much bow at a time. So that's a really good way to have the best of both worlds. And why not? Hey, you did the work. You might as well use that. And I think it'll serve you quite well. Okay. Now, everybody complained about the wise maid. So let's go back to the wise maid and do it a good couple of times slow. I'm going to put the metronome at 60. All right. Slower right down. It's gonna sound like this. Okay, I'll count you in. Oh, you're losing the falls. It was nice. Oh, they're gonna light it up pretty soon. They light at night they light it up, so you'll be able to see it there in a second. Here we go. One, two, three, go. Thank you. 
our time. like it was a more successful go. People seem to be hanging in for a little bit better that time. Is that right? Okay. And it was 63, just to let you know. 63 on the metronomes, what we just did. So if you had success there, I would keep practicing there. Pearl, you getting anywhere with your shoulder rest? I saw you messing with it a couple of times. Um, I did mess with it. I think it's still hurting, but I think it's because it started hurting earlier. But it's not getting worse. The pain isn't getting worse. Yeah. You, to, to really test it out and get the good place, you got to start fresh. So you want to, you know, tomorrow when you go to practice tomorrow, you take your fiddle out and do a few test runs. This is how you hold your fiddle with no shoulder. One, two, three. If there's any amount of this here after those three steps, you got to keep working on it. Okay, if it's any more complicated than that, one, two, three, that's it. If you have to do any more fancy stuff, you got to keep working on it. Find that comfy spot. You know, Yehudi Menuhin said, I don't know why they call it holding the violin. It's a balancing act. <laughs> and I always remember that. It's a really good way to think about it because you're trying to let it sit there. You're not holding it up. We have to, we're busy playing. We, don't, we, we can't hold up a fiddle. You got to let it sit there, but that's the hard part for sure. Thank you. Oh, no problem. No problem. Okay, good. That's great. So why don't we work on our Dr. O'Neill's now? Because everybody's been working so hard on it. And uh, you'll have to, oh, but first we're going to run up and down a, a scale, a roll scale. Okay. And I think we should do it in the key of D. Have we done a roll scale in the key of D yet? Or has it just been G? It's just to do yeah okay so let me show you what that's going to be like now d major oh, oh simone you look like you need that do you need that tune oh you got it okay uh d major we can't do in two octaves on the fiddle unless we shift and we're not going to be shifting tonight i you know I, they call that the dusty end of the fingerboard and i don't want to get my fingers dirty tonight so we're going to do what they call an octave and a half all right so we start on d we go all the way up to high a third finger on the E string. And then we're gonna go all the way down to low A. And that way we practice the D major rolls on all four strings, okay? Does that make sense? So it sounds like this. Okay, let's do it. And that was at 63 too, by the way. You think we can do it at that speed or is that too fast? Should be okay? Okay, let's do it. One, two, three, go! understand how that works <laughs> Simone you must love rolls <laughs> you're having a great time over there let's do it again people 
Same thing except better. One, two, three, go. Feel it, everybody. Not bad. Not bad. Okay, good. Let's go a little quicker. Just a bit. Yes, Sue. You're muted. Yeah, I have to unmute. After this, Dr. O'Neill's, if we don't know how to do roles, we never will know how to do roles. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> now, there's still hope. Never lose hope, man. Never lose hope. But it is a good one. It's That's why. That's why I thought it would be a good idea because that's what did it for me. I did Dr. O'Neill's and after that, suddenly roles were available. <laughs> okay, here we go one more time. One, two, three, go. <laughs> How are we getting along? I'm so sorry, but do you so do you go below the note too? Yeah. The note, the note above, the note again, the note below, the note to finish. Five notes all together. The first one is the longest one. Okay, let's do it again. One, two, three, go. Get such a nice rhythm, you know? Let's try a little faster. Now, remember, this is target practice. You don't have to get them all, but let's try a little faster. Give yourself an idea which ones work easy, which ones need more work, okay? A little bit faster. A one, two, three, and... How are you getting along with that? Did you have a, a decent bat and average there? Kinda. <laughs> we'll take it for now, okay? It's it was little. easier on the way down. Oh. You put all your fingers down. That's right. But on the way up, it's like, oh, gotta place the fingers correctly on the way up, which. Is that, yeah, it's a lot easier to take fingers off than it is to put them down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, cool. Dr. O'Neill's. So does anybody remember a metronome marking? Organized people that write things down? No? Okay, let's see. I'll give you a few examples, see what you think is going to work. Kind of like something like that would work, you think? Let's try it, see what happens. We'll do it twice for the practice. One, two, three.
one more. That's a workout and a half. How's everybody feeling at that tempo? Is it working? Oh, that's good. Right on. Anything not working? And I know not all the rolls, not 100% of the rolls are going to work for anybody. So don't worry too much about that. But is there any anything systemic anybody needs to work on before we try it faster? Think about it while I get a drink. One sec. I meant to get a water, but I wound up getting a beer. <laughs> I am on vacation after all. Anybody, anyway, anybody think of anything that they need help with, or is it just to keep practicing it? Nothing a few hundred times won't solve. Yes, Pearl. Not really a problem, but just for the last note, are you doing an octave double stop? No, I'm doing a fourth. Ah, uh, okay. That's why I... I because I did an octave double stop and it sounded weird. So I'll just... well, that's no, that's that's also totally fine. I mean, it really depends on what you want. But I will tell you that in the key of D, when I finish a tune, especially when it finishes on the D string, I almost always play the low A with it, making a fourth. And it's a really nice way to do it too. It's got a nice final sound. Octave is fine too. Great. Uh, that sounds good. I love that. I do that sometimes too, you know. The nice thing about the octave there, Pearl, is that you can slide into it. And it's nice. The octave is nice to slide into because it's easy to tell that when you've slid up far enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But the low A is what I usually do there. Okay. Anyone else? Anything, anything. Okay, well, you know what that means a little bit faster. <laughs> it's all right. Nobody will get hurt, I don't think. Okay, so let's see. That 
That is nice. That We are encroaching on a stately pace here, guys. So we're going to do it twice, maybe three times. I'm going to pound out that nice, easy rhythm there, the jig rhythm. Because this is a chance for everything to come together. And we'll see how you all do. I'll count you in. One, two, three. <laughs> thought it was too fast plain and simple yes okay so that was just to let you know i gotta say i enjoyed it a lot i really love that feel it reminds me of it's like irish reggae music you know what i mean it's like it's at that pace now a little known fact is that most reggae music was recorded at 60 beats a minute has anybody ever heard that fact before 
No. And the reason that it was that it, that that was decided is because that's the normal resting heart rate of a human is 60 beats per minute. So the and that's why it's so relaxing, right? You get that that feet that particular tempo is so relaxing when you get the nice reggae feel at that feel at that tempo. It's very relaxing. So I find this was probably I think it's going to be 80. I'm just going to see here or 76. So no, it's about 80. 80, yeah. That was exactly what we just played was 80, okay? And 80 is like Irish reggae tempo, okay? The, they call it the stately pace because it's on the backside. It's slow. There's no You wouldn't be able to dance to it, but it still has a nice feel. It has that jig feel present, but it's nice and slow. And I think, you know, the, the normal resting heart rate for a Jamaican is 60 because they're vegetarians mostly and they don't drink alcohol. But for Irish and Scottish, it's probably a little higher. You know what I mean? Like they abuse themselves a little bit more. So 80 is the Irish reggae tempo. OK, so that but that should be your aspiration, because if you had a few problems at 80, that's totally normal. But make that your aspiration. Your goal tempo is 80 beats per minute for Dr. O'Neill's practicing it at what was it like uh 65 or something like that practicing at 65 or 70 and 80 is your goal for now all right now i'm taking requests who wants to practice what in our last 10 minutes i am open anybody have any requests can we do the Bally desmonds yes and it, it occurred to me that we haven't done very many polkas, slides, or hornpipes. We also haven't done very many stress phase, only a couple. And I just recently got a couple of corkers, all right? So I think that we should kind of get to work on that stuff. Jigs and reels are great, but there's so many different kind of types of tunes out there, and it's fun to go through them. Even barn dances. Have you guys ever heard of something called a barn dance? You, you have some out. Check this out. Isn't that just the greatest little tune? Lots of energy, not that hard. Get the feel right and everybody's feeling it. So I think it'd be fun to get some of that stuff too. We'll just run the whole gamut. Don't let me forget about all those different tunes. You get what you get bound up in jigs and reels. You know what I mean? Anyway, so Bally Desmond Pocus. Here's how they go, if anybody can't remember. Is that a good tempo? You think we can handle that tempo? Kind of? Well, let's see. Let's see. I'll count you in. You getting some light show yet? Yeah, it's green. It's green right now. The falls are green. Now they're blue. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And then at like midnight, they start panning it around. It gets all crazy and is, is kind of neat like so i never you know i've never had such a good time at, at, at uh, niagara falls like i've been here a few times but this having a view of the falls out the room definitely worth it and not that expensive uh, 135 bucks a night for this hotel the uh, marriott falls view hotel yeah it was really it was not that expensive as we've been enjoying it <laughs> okay here we go belly desmond pocus Oh, one, 
two, three, ah. <laughs> from the past, eh? Now, Karen, are these tunes that you play? Uh, I'm sure you played them before. I know that they're... Uh, no, I haven't. But there's, you know, with Irish music, it's... Uh, or if that was an Irish tune. Um, it sure was. There's, there's runs that are the same. Yes. So in part B of one of the first focus, um, it was easy. And then yeah. the other stuff, like I was just watching your hand and then listening and trying to hit some notes, but... Um, Okay, well, those ones that you are so right about the Irish tunes, my friend Jim McGee says, if you learn the right tunes, then you've learned all the tunes because it's just kind of mix and match the bits yeah. and endings and stuff like that, you know? So that's a good point. But I'll tell you, the Belly Desmond polkas, polkas are a must-have. Everybody oh. has them in their bag of tricks. I've played them in, I think, nine different countries. So they're very, oh. very universal. It's, it's Belly Desmond number three, and Ballet Desmond number one, I think. Okay, so what you play, you did AABB of number one, and then, or number three rather, and then AABB of number one? 
Yes, we did each one three times, and they're famously oh, played times. together. They're always played together. Okay, well, you know what? I'll look for those on YouTube. Unless you have it recorded on your channel or no? It's all up on my channel because we did it ages ago when the class first started. Okay. So I'll look for it. And, then, yeah. uh, and, uh, and they're there. always played together. There's a Valley Desmond number two, but that's not usually played together with those two. And it's the type of thing, if you were to play one without the other, people would look at you funny. You know what I mean? Oh, okay. 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 So good to have, yeah. and you'll get it in a second. Yeah. 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 Who else? Jocelyn, are you not unfamiliar with those with those uh, polkas? No, I've I've um I've not heard them before. Mm hmm Do you do you have the music uploaded or? Yeah, I'll send you guys the music as well. I got okay. I found good session dot org versions. Okay. I sent them out, so I'll just forward you that those emails. But like I said, very good to have under your belt. They definitely get played everywhere. So. Yeah, and they're lovely. You guys will get them in a minute. It's, you know, first phrase, second phrase, first phrase ending for both tunes. Not very hard. Okay. So it makes me want to learn some more music because we, I know we've been practicing hard, right? We've been using these tunes that build certain skills and getting them stronger slowly. And I love that. And that's great. But I want to learn more tunes. So next time, uh, which is going to be uh, after St. Patrick's Day. So basically, we're not going to play Irish music next time because we will have Irish hangovers, hopefully, most of us, you know, from the music, uh, the diddly diddly. We, we're still going to do diddly diddly, but it's going to be the scotchy kind. And it's going to be a tune called Calumbreach. It's a Strass Bay. <laughs> Stress Bay there. Now, somebody, thank you. Somebody was mentioning this here, right? And that's basically why we're going to do this tune. If you get this tune and you get it good, this here is going to be much stronger just as a byproduct, okay? So, and also it's a kick in tune. Every time I play it, the whole place goes nuts. So, we're going to get that tune next time. We're going to take a drastic Scottish turn and away from uh, the Irish stuff just for a bit. All right, sound good? Okay, you guys know what to work on. Keep up that practice, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a million. Thanks, Dan. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay.